So uh, this part of the workshop, we're going to go through um, the Jupyter Hub and the use of uh, Jupyter Notebooks for using PMAGPI software. Um, so we go to the Jupyter Hub um, and you have to have your Earthref handle, which uh, you were sent instructions on how to get one. Once you've done that, you can go in to this website and you'll see these two things. Um, one is, I wanted to point out that there's a, a class for how to use Python starting from the very beginning. Um, this, that's this Python for Earth Science students. Once you have an Earthref account, you can go in and teach yourself Python, um, not PMAGPI, but it's the, what underlies PMAGPI. So if you're curious about switching from MATLAB to Python, for example, um, or anything, or, or you've never programmed before at all, this class will help you get there. What we're going to do today is use something called PMAGPI um, online. And to activate it in your own, once you get into the Jupyter Hub, the Earthref Jupyter Hub, you click on this PMAGPI online setup notebook. And then this explains what is PMAGPI. Um, and you can read that on your own. And then to start using it, you go to this first cell, uh, click on it, and run. And that installs PMAGPI and updates it to the most recent version. And then um, this gets the notebooks out of uh, a, a public repository, which, by the way, you could just install this on your own computer. Um, but this way you don't have to install anything. So you run this second cell and it updates the website, the uh, Jupyter Hub to the latest version of PMAGPI. If, um, then um, uh, we go, this, what this says is to go to the um, file menu and then open. And what we want to open is PMAGPI online um, directory, which you just created. And then I'm going to illustrate, there's a lot of notebooks here, uh, which illustrate different parts of PMAGPI since that's a very large software package. What I'm going to look at today is this PMAGPI online notebook, which is the one that's um, it's an introduction. Once you feel comfortable with notebooks and you want to explore further, you can click on like this magic one, which uh, um, demonstrates a lot of the things that Rupert was talking about with the API, how to get stuff out of magic and deal with it. Um, it doesn't have putting stuff into magic yet because that's brand new and I haven't added that yet, but it will be there eventually. You can make various plots and analyses. Um, basically, almost anything that PMAGPI um, does is illustrated in one of these notebooks. Um, so we're going to start with PMAGPI online, which is um, an overview, if you will. So there's an abstract. Um, <clears throat> Nick already explained a little bit about the magic um, data model, uh, I just wanted to remind you there are nine tables. One is this contribution table that Nick showed you examples of, a locations table which uh, defines the different locations, sites, sample specimens, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I forgot to put measurements in here. <laughs> I should have done that. Uh, and then um, how to get how to install Python on your own computer if you don't want to use uh, the Jupyter Hub. Um, and the Jupyter Hub doesn't have any of the GUIs. So if you want to use the Telia GUI or the PMAG GUI, um, you have to install it on your computer. But now to use this notebook, we start with um, importing a bunch of things that we're going to use in this directory. 
uh, what this script does. You don't really have to know Python to understand it. I've tried to document it with um, comments, um, but uh, we import the underlying um, pmagpy functionality this way. So I just click on that and, um, and then we're ready to go. So uh, there's three examples in this notebook of how to use pmagpy. As I said, it's just, there's hundreds of examples. So you have to look in the other notebooks, start with the introduction one, and that'll um, uh, tell you where to go to find the functions that you are interested in. Um, okay, so here's an example that uses the API that Rupert just was talking about within the notebook. So uh, the first thing we want to do is make sure uh, we have this directory pmagpy online and it creates a few directories. Oh, one thing is to use these notebooks, if you want to change them at all, you, you should make a copy because these are, are uh, write protected so you can't modify them. But um, if you make a copy, make a copy, then, uh, then you will have a permanent notebook that you can do whatever you want to um, within this repository and it won't get overwritten and um, all of your changes will be saved. Okay, so the first example is if you were hunting around on the database and you found um, an ID number, the contribution ID that uh, you wanted to work with, you can download those that contribution file directly into the notebook um, this way. So there's a function, one of our modules is called IPMAG, which was started by Nick Swanson Heisel and added to. What it does is it makes the PMAG PI functions useful within a notebook environment. So that was the intention of this module. So this module has in it a function called download magic from ID, which looks promising. And if you, know the name of a particular function, but you can't remember how it works or you don't know how it works, you can always use this help and then you put the function name inside parentheses and it will tell you what is expected for this uh, particular uh, function. So, um, <clears throat> and you just, uh, that works for any of the PMAG functions, you'll get the documentation string back that way. I use it all the time because I can't remember all the details of all these functions, so um, it helps. So now I'll show you how to use it. Uh, I happen to know a uh, magic contribution ID for a particular study that I want to work on. So um, I set a variable name called dir path, which is the directory path where I want to work in, where I want to put the data. And then uh, this um, creates a string with that's called magic underscore contribution underscore and then my magic ID and then dot text. And then so I, I just uh, put the IPMAG download magic. All I do is I have to put the magic ID into here, call it and then I'm, what this does is it renames what got downloaded to that magic contribution um, ID number, this string, and, uh, and basically moves it into this path, into this directory. So I've created a directory to put it in. Then I uh, get the down, uh, download the data and then I move it into that directory with this function. Okay, so I do that and it worked. And then this last function took that text file that we downloaded. 
which is this uh, long text file that has all the tables embedded in it. And there's a function called download magic. And I guess we should have called it unpack magic, but it's called download magic. And what it does is it unpacks the text file into the individual text files for each table that are, is in that contribution. And you can see that it, it created a file called contributions.txt, locations.txt, sites, and here's all the, the data that went with that particular contribution. There's another way to do this, which I like quite a bit. And instead of having to go to the magic database to find, to do the search and find the contribution ID, um, I could, if I know the DOI of the paper, I can just put that in and I can use this function, download magic from DOI. And this happens to be the same one. Um, and so um, I uh, can just, um, instead of having to know the contribution ID, I just need to know the DOI and it works exactly the same way. So if you want to know more about download magic, of course, you could uh, say help ipmag.download magic from DOI, and it'll tell me what I can do. Um, and so it says all I need is the DOI, and it brings back the um, the uh, data for that particular DOI. Okay, now let's use the data. We just downloaded it from MAGIC. Um, it's a published paper um, and we wanna look at the data. So what do paleomagnetists do? Well, they look at directions with equal area nets. So here's a, um, a function called eq area underscore magic, which reads magic formatted files and makes declination inclination, you know, it makes equal area projections of the data. Every, pretty much everybody with a lab has something that does this already, but um, I think it's kind of handy to have. So um, this, uh, we did help eq area magic. Um, it wants an in file, and this is set, the default is to sites.txt because that has all of the site level directions in it. Um, uh, and the, the default directory path is the one that will end, but we will set that to our download directory, magic import directory. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot of defaults, the input directory, the output directory, the which file you want to use, um, and um, whether you want to save the plots or not, what format you want to save them in. You, there's a variety of uh, formats you can save it in. Um, and uh, whether you want uh, color contours or um, whether you want to plot the uncertainty ellipses, the alpha 95s. Um, so there's a lot of uh, different uh, options here. I'm just going to show the simplest one. So here I call EQ area magic and I set the directory path to the dir, path, dir underscore path that I set up here. You can set that to anything you, you like that exists within your workspace. And uh, I don't want to save the plots um, right now. So I just run this. It reads in the data file and it makes this plot. Now you can change the colors. You can save the file. Let's say we say save plots is true. Um, I created an SVG file here. Let's say I want a PNG. Um, instead, um, I've lost my, uh, my mouse. So format equals PNG. Uh, 
And so now how do I use this? Say I wanna put it into a, a Word document or something. So I go up to file, open, and here's the, um, the uh, figure that I just made, right? And so I just click on that and download it. And I can download it to my desktop. And, um, and it's right on my, uh, my desktop and I could open it if I wanted. I could put it into, um, a, I could put it into um, a document, another document, I can publish it, whatever I want. So uh, I could edit it. If I saved it as an SVG, EPS or PDF or some editable form, I could edit this with uh, Adobe Illustrator and whatever. So this is a way you just make the figure, you have the code which made the figure and, um, and then you put in your paper and then you can edit it later and you know what you did. So that's the advantage of this approach. Uh, okay, so I go back to my notebook. Um, Lisa, a quick question. So you there's a way to display that image right in the Python notebook. So you could just have it show up right afterwards. Right. Um, let's see, did I? Yeah, I could do that. Okay. Um, if this is false, then it shows it right there. Okay. If you want the one that you created, uh, you see it, it does pop up, but not if you save the file. Right, okay. Um, but- you, you just run it twice and- you it. Just run it, or, or you can put in, there is another way, image, and then you put in the, um, um, uh, well, then you need to know the name of it. Anyway, yeah, yeah, you can you can you can display it using this image thing if you know the name and the path of your file, but it just does pop right up there. Great. It plots is false, so you can look at it, and then if you like it, it plots is true, and then there it is. Hmm? Yeah. Did somebody else have a question, Kathy? Somebody said something. Oh well. Um, so um, now we can do the same thing. We can make people like to make um, maps of VGPs. So uh, here's there is a function called VGP map for magic formatted files, which is called VGP map underscore magic. And uh, here's the help file help message for that. Um, and so um, it's sim there's similar uh, things. You can change the symbol, you can change the size of the symbols, you can change the, the colors, et cetera, et cetera. This is pretty much the default. Um, this is this, so this is the same directory path that we used before. So that's where I put the magic data in this, uh, um, in my working space. This sets the size of the symbols. I wanted to flip the reverse, uh, the southerly VGPs to Northern Hemisphere, and they're done with two different um, colors. So one of these are the normals and one of them is the reverse. Um, the, this uh, is the same as before. You don't wanna say, if you want, on a same plot, you set this to true. This sets the um, latitude for the center of the diagram. So it puts it at 60 degrees. It takes an orthographic um, projection and rotates it so that your this is 60 is the center of this plot. And the you can also set the lons, the zero longitude, the central longitude. Um, 
so you can see all the data if if they're not all right around because if you if they're all right around the north pole then you won't see half of them unless you you rotate the projection so this allows you to rotate the projection how you like um, this r sim sets the reverse symbol style to blue triangles so this tells me that these blue triangles are the reverse antipodes of the reversely magnetized VGPs and the size. So I could I can customize this a lot of different ways. And I can save the plot and put it into it put it into my paper uh, or save it in an editable editable form, uh, edit it with say Adobe Illustrator or something. And then put it in my my paper. Um, uh, this way. So you don't really have to know Python to make these plots. Uh, many people also want to know whether their data are uh, pass a reversals test. There are many kinds of reversals tests. PMAGPI supports most of them. The one that I like, of course, is the bootstrap one that, that Kathy and I came up with low these many years ago. Um, and um, uh, so we have a bootstrap reversal test, which uh, will read in the data. And this would be the site level data. It has, uh, I read it into um, a pandas data frame, which um, I think Nick mentioned. Uh, and if you don't know what pandas data frames are, take my class <laughs> or uh, just try to muddle through by editing this. Um, if you want to, for example, filter the data, let's say the site table has lots of different data and different formats and different coordinate systems and things, then if it's in a pandas data frame, there are straightforward ways of filtering the data. Um, it's very powerful. Um, and um, the and so once it's in a data frame actually let me show you what a data frame looks like um so for example if i want to just see what's in that data frame a data frame is like an excel spreadsheet so it has it, it has uh, all the column headers like age, age high, low, the age unit, the citation, the criteria for acceptance, the alpha 95, um, and so on and so forth. Um, say some of the data are bad, I could put in a filter to only look at things with result quality that are good or exclude all the data that were marked by the author as bad. Um, I can uh, filter for by age or but whatever. So pandas is a really powerful way of uh, filtering, sorting, and editing um, things like spreadsheets. So if you think of a pandas data frame as a spreadsheet with uh, with extra power, then um, then uh, then. It's once you get used to them, they're really wonderful. One of the reasons why I really like Python. So in this case, it read in all of the data from that sites table, which are up here. It fished out the de declinations and inclinations, which in magic speak is dir underscore dec dir underscore inc. And it, um, so I fished them out here. And then, um, so this is how, this is an example of uh, filtering. So I put all the declinations. This, this is the data frame. This is the, just a minute, somebody's having a conversation up here. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, this takes the data frame, it takes out the column labeled uh, dir deck, and it converts it to an array of values. 
So I can look at that too. Let's see what that looks like. So dex uh, looks like this. It's a um, it's an array of all the declinations. And uh, these are all the inclinations. I stuff those into this IPMAG reversal test bootstrap. I set, I tell it the deck key is uh, dex and the ink uh, key is inks. And um, if I wanted to plot the Sterionet, I would set this to true. And then, uh, and then what it does is it takes the, so here's the stereonet of the directions. And here are the X components, Y components, and Z components. It's taken the, um, it's taken the data and split it into two modes. So, and those are ortho, those are antipodal. So one presumably would be the normal data and one presumably would be the reverse data. And then it compares the X uh, components, Y components and Z components of those two sets of data, the normal and normal and reverse data, one mode versus the other. <coughs> it flopped the red ones over because it decided this was the reverse one. It takes one of them and takes the antipode, and um, and then it compares the x components of one mode against the other, and the ninety five percent bounds on those modes. And so this case, you can see that the reverse data are are not the same as the normal data. In fact, the X components and the Y, the Z, the Y components are, so they haven't rotated with respect to each other, but the, the reverse data are slightly uh, more shallower than the normal data here. And you can see actually there's two groups here. So there's more to this story and you should read the paper if you wanna know the whole story, but uh, there's more to this story than, um, uh, just a simple rotation or something that there's two groups and this fails the, the um, reversals test. So if you were about to write a paper, you would um, um, want to know what was going on and you would fish through and filter by age or by location or, you know, whatever to figure out why there's two groups in the reverse data. And, um, and so there's a whole story there, um, but uh, we're not gonna do that here. We're just working on the code. <laughs> then another thing that people really like to do is, uh, how am I doing on time? Am I, I was taking my time here. Anyway, we can make them. Yeah, we have an hour left, uh, so. Um, we scheduled you for an hour, so you have 30 minutes, so we have quite a bit. I think I can do that. All right, so people also like to make maps of where the sites come from, where your paleomag site sampling sites were. So this, uh, this function, it's in a different um, module, it's called PMAG Plotlib, and there's something called plot map, which is a very generic map making function, um, it's supposed to take the pain of making maps using Cartopi or, or even ArcGIS out of it. So there's a lot of options. <clears throat> For example, what projection you want. We support a number of different projections. You can select bounds uh, for the map the central latitude, longitude, the, the symbols and the colors and the details, whether you want the coastlines, whether you want the country, states, et cetera, et cetera. So here's an example for this study that we were just looking at, which was uh, from the Golan Heights, recently published by Bahar et al. <coughs> and, um, and here again, I read in 
the site table into our data frame. I fish out the latitudes and longitudes, which are the site locations. And, um, and I set, I want the symbol to be red stars. I want the size to be pretty big. I want a Lambert conformal projection. I want to put the grid on um, and I want the bounds to be this and um, and I do want the coastlines, uh, the country, the oceans, and the countries. And I can change the colors if I want to. This is uh, and the resolution. Now this is important. If you make a high resolution one, it takes a while, but it's nicer, obviously. Um, if you want a really low resolution one, crude quickie plot, then you select. Your, your choices are up here, uh, crude, <laughs> low, intermediate, and high. So for the final plot, you'd want high, but you got to take your time. So this is intermediate level um, resolution. You can see all these plots come up in the Golan Heights, all the dots. Uh, these are two weird sites that Hagai Ron took a long time ago uh, before he passed away, obviously. There's the Sea of Galilee. And, um, and so that we have a, a reasonable um, uh, base map. Then you could save this file and put on uh, Egypt, um, Israel, you know, West Bank, uh, 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 Jordan, or whatever, uh, Syria. You can put the labels on later. Okay, so that's the first example where we just did basic paleomag plots. Now, I wanted to show you how, say you did it uh, Nick's way, where you downloaded the data to your desktop, and then, or you had a data set on your own desktop that you had formatted into magic format, um, then you can upload data to the Jupyter Hub and work on it the same way. So uh, first, we let's make a little directory called upload. And um, I'm just going to use the same uh, 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 another data file that I already downloaded. Um, so I, I download a, a file. Here you can see I got this magic contribution on my desktop. And then um, I can upload this to uh, so I, I upload this by going to uh, open under file. And then there's a key over here called upload. And I go to the desktop and I upload uh, that file that I downloaded from Magic. And then I click on it and I upload, boom. And that goes into my, um, let's see if it did it. And then, um, and then I go back to my notebook. Uh, and then I move that file to, um, to the directory that I wanted in the same way that we did before. So uh, I rename it um, and move it into that directory. And then I uh, unpack it the same way that I did before. So um, this tells you how to do it. Um, we uploaded it and then we renamed it. And now we're going to unpack it with download magic, the same thing we just did um, on the other contribution. So now let's make some plots. This is a different kind of data set. It's uh, a data set from an IODP leg. So it has magnetostratigraphy in it. And, um, and so let's make some plots. For example, uh, I want to uh, make a magnetostratigraphy um, plot with 
I want to put on the time scale. And I want to plot the declination, the inclinations of the data, because these are IODP drill cores, they're almost never oriented with respect to the horizontal. So I'll just plot the inclination data from a particular uh, demagnetization step. And then I also want to put on the expected inclination at that site, just for fun. So the steps to do this is first, we'll get in the data into a pandas data frame, as we've done now three times, two times. Um, and then um, I want to, uh, and this is a, a text file, so I'll read it in as a text file. And this tells you what uh, pandas requires. I need to set the separator as a tab because um, the all magic data files are, the text files are all tab delimited. Um, and, um, and the column headers are in the second row. So in Python, counting starts with zero. So I have to set the header to be the first row, which is actually the second row because Panda, because Python does it that way. <laughs> um, and I want to just plot it, plot the data from particular depths. Uh, so um, I uh, take, I set my depth min and max to uh, 40 meters and 160 meters. Um, I read in the measurement data here into a data frame, pandas data frame. And you see, I have the path set here. This is the file name. This is the separator, it's tab delimited and the row in which the headers are in. So the column headers, and that would be uh, the second row, which here is one. Then I re read in the site data which um, has the, uh, the depths in it. So the way the data model works is that there's all these different tables, but the thing that you want, for example, the height um, uh, would be in the site level table, but you might want the measurement data, which doesn't have the height. So we can merge them together using pandas tricks. So I'm reading in these different tables as measurement data frame, site data frame, specimen data frame, and the ages data frame. And um, I filter, here's an example of pandas filtering. And, uh, and I only want ages uh, that were constrained by the magnetostratigraphy themselves. So whoever did this study uh, picked boundaries and put those uh, tie points into the ages table. And so I want to fish those out here. I want to drop all the data that have that are that have no demagnetization data. So this when pandas read this in, it assigned blanks to not a number. And this function will drop all of those uh, measurements that do not have a treatment set. And then I filter out all the ones that um, are 20 millitesla step. And uh, in magic, all units are teslas. <laughs> so it's 0.02 teslas is the same as 20 millitesla's. And so now I've got in this data frame, all the data that were demagnetized to 20 millitesla's. Um, also, uh, I need a site name um, and in uh, magnetostratigraphy, in this case, in IODP data, you have one specimen per horizon. One horizon is one site. So the site is name is the same as the specimen name. So here I'm just creating a new column called site <coughs> and, uh, and the same in the specimen data frame. Then um, 
I just want the depths, core depths out of the site data frame. And so I'm just now picking out only those columns named site and core depth out of the site data frame, merging it with a specimen data frame and merging it with the measurement data frame. And now I can uh, filter the data. Here's an example of data filtering based on depth. So all those data that are greater than my minimum and less than my maximum are now in this data frame. And the same thing for that. Um, and so I set the latitude as the latitude of all of this site with this. Now I can make my plot and I'm going to plot the measurement level. This is the um, whole core data, if you will, done on the ship for um, <clears throat> the 20 millitesla step. And these are the specimen level data and they were discrete samples taken from the core and demagnetized to the same level. And so I can plot those with a different symbol. I'm gonna plot the whole core data as blue circles and the discrete specimen data as little red triangles. Alpha here uh, sets a, uh, an opacity, so um, the you can see through the data the the red triangles. This lets me see through these big dots. And then I set the limits um, of the plot here, uh, and I calculate um, the latitude, the inclination expected at this latitude with this little function. So I'm gonna call it GAD. Uh, and this is, there's a function called pink, which is paleo inclination at that latitude. So this is a PMAG function. Um, and it's just tan I equals two tan lat. Everybody should know that. Um, and then um, I plot that as a vertical line here um, with, that's green, a dashed green vertical line. And so here we go. Um, uh, and I wanted to put on the time scale. And so, um, oops, I didn't run this. Okay. So here you see my plot. Here's the time scale in millions of years based on the interpretations of the author. Um, and uh, these are the, the blue dots are the inclinations measured on the whole core. The red triangles are the inclinations measured on the discrete samples. And you can see this is a pretty good magnetostratigraphy um, and um, not perfect, but you know, as ODP data go, it's not too bad. And these are the, the labels for the picks that came from the ages table. So whatever you put in there, that's what gets plotted here. So you could change the ages, the tie points, and then replot them <clears throat> to reanalyze the data. Now I'll show you an example of the, this particular study, um, somebody measured the anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility. And so we could plot that using um, this function, ipmeg any underscore depth plot to plot the um, magnetic susceptibility. Here's the help message for how, how it's done. These are optional um, keys that you can specify. If you don't put anything in, it'll take the specimen table from the directory path that you, uh, that you um, set. And the specimen table has in it, in this case, it has um, the anisotropy uh, tensors. So this, func this function will fish those out. And here we plot 
for the same minimum maximum depth. We plot um, the eigenvalues. This is the Christmas tree plot that I love. Um, it's the maximum eigenvalue, of course, is the biggest one. <laughs> and those are plotted as uh, red, uh, uh, red squares. The intermediate ones are blue triangles and the minimum ones are little black circles. And you can see the uh, anisotropy changes as a function of depth. And there is a whole paleoceanographic story associated with these data. This is the anisotropy. <coughs> this is the inclination of the minimum axis, which should be vertical because these are sediments. And you can see they're not always vertical. Sometimes they're, they're uh, um, quite a bit off, especially in these very low anisotropy um, uh, areas, regions. And the declination should be random because these are unoriented cores. The declination shouldn't have any um, consistency down core. And here's the bulk susceptibility. Boo -doo 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 -doo. So you can make plots like that. What I like about the new uh, magic data model is that, as Rupert mentioned, we have this thing called external results. Now, uh, someone put the natural gamma radiation that was scanned on the ship into the magic database, into the magic data model. And that is uh, plotted here. So um, we can use any depth plot as we did. And then we can plot the, um, we can read in uh, the, the um, NDR data, natural gamma radiation from the, um, uh, from the external uh, data result, external results label. And here it is. And you can see that the low anisotropy are associated with a higher NGR. I mean, the high anisotropy levels are associated with higher NGR. And in this case, natural gamma radiation is associated with the clay. So boom, these are cycles of high clay, low clay regions, and the clays are laminated, and therefore you have high anisotropy, whereas the low clay regions, which are dominated in this case by diatoms, it's got low anisotropy. So the low NGR is associated with um, the, the, the diatom layers. And so you get this paleoceanographic variation, stone core. Lovely. And, um, and so if you just examine how this is done, it shows how to manipulate the magic data using pandas data frames. So a fourth example, I lied, there's four. Um, this one um, is completely different. Uh, it uses um, IGRF-like tables that Kathy spent her, a lot of her career creating for us, for uh, which gives you the secular variation of the magnetic field over the last <clears throat> 10,000 years. Sometimes some of them go to 14,000 um, uh, for the, for IGRF-like models. Those are um, with um, the uh, G's, with the Gauss coefficients. So if you know the Gauss coefficients for a particular age, you can calculate the direction of the magnetic field at any place. So in principle, we can calculate the magnetic field direction at any place at any time over the last 10,000 years, which is pretty cool. So uh, here again, um, I'm gonna use uh, pink, which gives me what the inclination should be at that location. Um, um, I showed you that before. Um, so, um, and then there's a function in IPMAG called IGRF, which you can supply your own uh, spherical harmonic model by setting what's called a GH file 
or you can use the IGRF, or you can use one of the models that have been put in. And I've put in, I hope, all of Kathy's models. Um, and I've also put in these new uh, Shaw, uh, Shock um, 2K and Shot F14. So there's uh, Pabon Carrosco and Camposano and Osete and um, <clears throat> and so there's a number of models uh, that are in PMAGPI that you can then plot against your own data if you're interested in archaeomagnetism or something. So um, all we need to know is the date. So Unfortunately, I haven't uh, fixed it so that it'll do any dates after 2020. My apologies, it's on my to-do list, but we can go up to 2019.9, uh, so a year ago, um, and a particular latitude and longitude, and I put here the latitude and longitude of San Diego because I wish I was there. Um, and, uh, and I use ipmag.igrf at this date, the altitude I set to zero, the lat and long here, and it gives me um, the declination, inclination, and intensity at this location for that date. Now I can do this as a function of time. So, and I want to use one of these models. So I'm using one of Kathy's recent models here. Um, I have uh, these are your choice of models. And I want to look at the data for this location over this range of ages. And in my software, positive numbers are common era. So the last 2000 years. 20, 20 years, um, or uh, before, uh, in the before common era. So this goes from minus 8,000, which is 10,000 years ago, to up to 2,000. And, um, uh, and so I go through a list of all these dates. I make a list of dates. I step through one by one. I create a data frame uh, and um, I plot the declinations, inclinations, and intensity as a function of age. So I guess this should say common era, not AD. Let me shift away from that. But um, so there you go. There's your plot. You can change the latitude, the longitude. You can change the model. Um, and uh, just be aware of not all models go for the whole time. Like the shock, shock 2K only goes from 0 to, two, to 2,000. And the shock Iron Age only goes um, for the 1,000 years before uh, the common era. But um, <clears throat> these models go. The Pavon Carrasco model goes for the last 14,000 years. So you can pick your model, you can pick your location, you can pick your age range, and you can customize these plots however you like. Once you learn a little bit about MATLAB, MATPLOTLIB plotting functions, and you can take my class. If you're a MATLAB person, it should look fairly familiar because it's based on MATLAB, it's very similar. Now I can also make a global map for um, at a given uh, height away from the core mantle boundary. So say the surface of the earth at a particular date. Um, and th that's done using this function pmagplotlib.plotmagmap. And you set uh, what kind of, uh, um, what element you want to plot, like for example, declination or inclination or intensity. Um, you can set the color map, the central longitude, uh, the date, you can put on contours or not. You can set the projection I particularly like the um, 
mole wide projection. Um, and uh, and so then we go to um, we set the date, we set the model. <coughs> we can make this older, but whatever. Set the model. Um, we can set the um, other required keys here, and then get uh, lists of declinations, inclinations, intensities, um, and radial intensities and the longitudes and latitudes at which they were evaluated at. So we get all these things um, out of the do mag map function. And then we can send these once it's finished thinking uh, to plot mag map. Um, and so here's plot mag map. This first one uh, plots the intensities. And here you see the central the South Atlantic anomaly. And this is the <clears throat> field strength around the globe for, for 2019. This scale is in microtesla. And here are the inclinations and the declinations. And then I could do this. I could create these. I could save these um, figures into a a file into a directory, and I can make a movie. Um, I'm, I'm not going to do that right now because it takes a lot of time, but you can come back to this. I want to set, uh, I want to use the jet color map, and I want the intensity as a function. I have my dates ranging from minus 1,000 to, to 2,000 or to 2100 in 500 year steps. This is just because it takes forever to do it. And I can make, uh, I store all the PNGs files, the, the files in uh, an output directory. Uh, and then see, this is, I save the figure which is created in the directory that I specified and uh, I get my uh, figure name and uh, I make it a PNG file. And so I have these just few things uh, and I create a movie out of that this way. So I use, uh, I append all the images using this thing called image IO, image read. And um, I can put in a little delay if I want. And then I save this movie as a GIF. And this plays the GIF. So this is this very crude model. I did, for your amusement, uh, a model um, with a lot more uh, time steps in it. And that's this one using these date ranges. So 50 year time steps. Um, and this takes a while to create all the images, but you can see here's the, the South Atlantic anomaly growing and terrifying us. Woo! And then we go back and it just, it's a GIF. So it just keeps playing. And that is the end of this. I want to, just before we go quickly remind you that there are um, uh, lots of, of other notebooks. So I, I urge you to go look at the introduction notebook, which will explain where to find all the different packages and plotting functions that we have. You can also look in this one, plots and analyses, to see if there's uh, an example of how to make the kind of plot that you want. And this is taking a while, maybe because everybody's in there. I don't know. Well, it's going to take a while. OK, so come back on your own time and take a look through. Uh, make, be sure to make a copy of whatever notebook you want to play with. And um, I also urge you to um, check out the class in Python, because there is um, 
a series of uh, a bunch of lectures which teach you everything you need to know to manipulate uh, the, the notebooks that I just showed you. So if you want to get more um, fancy, fancier, um, then you should read these. So if you want to learn Pandas data frames, there's quite a bit of examples in, in here. OK. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Or maybe I should keep it. I don't know. I, I'll open it up to questions. Thanks, Lisa. That was quite an informative talk. It's nice to see all those functions um, working on the magic data stuff. I should probably show you this one. These are examples of how to manipulate magic data in particular, create magic files, convert your data from your format into magic format, and so on and so forth. And, and um, so uh, you could, you should probably look at that one, how to read in magic data files, how to write magic data files, combine them, a lot of the tricks I was just showing you. Right. <clears throat> but these are the, the, um, I haven't put in your new one. Um, the uh, Squid, my, my, my cross few ones. I didn't put that in yet. Yeah. But there's a bunch here. So, okay, questions?